I'm asked sometimes, can a blackberry bush grow in North Dakota? My answer, definitely yes, until the first winter comes and then it dies. <laughs> but there is hope we hear from NDSU. David Mettler, a graduate student from the Department of Plant Sciences, is going to share with us the new strategies that are being developed that are going to give all of us blackberry lovers hope. So David, welcome to our forum. Thank you, Tom. Uh, yes, so I'm a graduate student here at NDSU, and I am researching and studying growing blackberries, specifically floricane blackberries in North Dakota. So why even grow blackberries? Um, we'll be covering a little bit about that, as well as some plant physiology for those of you who are not familiar with blackberries. I'll be talking about the primocane research that has been going on, as well as the floricane research. And then some recommendations for you homeowners out there, as well as some conclusions that we can make with further research needing to be done. And yes, I did actually grow those blackberries in that picture. Um, they're very nice, uh, very tasty. So why grow blackberries? Well, for one thing, they're very healthy. They have a high level of vitamins and antioxidants. They also are very flavorful, uh, depending on the cultivar but they're good eaten fresh or as a jelly or a jam or even in pies. Another good thing, it might look like a poor thing, but uh, the shipping quality. Blackberries are known for having a uh, short shelf life, not good for shipping, which can be a good thing for homeowners or local producers. In this kind of a system, we have this niche market that's created for a local producer the bigger uh, companies out in uh, the West Coast or from Mexico uh, can't compete with us because they cannot ship the goods here. Uh, so this has a niche market for local growers as well as that increased demand for locally grown uh, farm fresh fruit and vegetables. So it could uh, give some extra cash flow to uh, local growers. So if they're so great, why isn't there more production? Well, as Tom alluded to earlier, uh, they're not recommended for North Dakota. Uh, we have harsh winters, uh, usually zone three for most of the state, zone four here in the Red River Valley area. And we have no hardy cultivars uh, recommended for growing up here. Uh, most of them are zone five or higher. It's also traditionally a biennial fruiting system. And what I mean by this is that your canes need to survive the winter in order to be able to produce the next year. So you have to get these above ground canes to survive the harsh winter in order to produce fruit. Also, there's a high startup cost in order to protect these blackberries. Uh, one of those would be a high tunnel, which could cost anywhere up to $25,000 an acre to protect the blackberries. So just a little bit about that plant physiology I was talking about. We have a perennial uh, production system here with a perennial roots and crown system. And in the first year of growth, uh, there'll just be a vegetative cane known as the primocane that will grow uh, up from the crown. This primocane will not flower or fruit, uh, but it'll just be vegetative throughout that first growing season. And then as it overwinters with the lower temperatures and low, shorter day length, those buds will change from uh, vegetative to reproductive, and it'll be known as a floricane the following year in which it will flower and produce fruit. The floricane will then die. This is why I call it a biennial fruiting system. The canes only live for two years. Now, until recently, this is the only way that blackberries were able to produce. However, there was a recent release uh, called a primocane fruiting blackberry. And in this type of a system, the primocane will actually vegetatively grow throughout most of the summer, and it will flower in the late, late summer and produce in the fall. And what will happen is it'll produce in the very tips of the canes. It will overwinter and then produce on the rest of the cane the following year. So you have a potential for two harvests, one late in the summer or the early fall, and then one earlier in the summer the next year. This is just an example of some of that uh, physiology I was talking about. You have the floor cane, uh, the woodier looking canes in the background, and you have the new prima canes coming up uh, right in that crown area. Another thing to keep in mind is the growth habit of blackberries. When you're looking at what type of system you would want to use to grow them, you have to remember what type of growth habit it has. 
So we have an erect type of blackberry, uh, semi-erect and trailing. And this just dictates the type of growth habit that they have with the canes, if they're going to stand upright or if they're going to trail along the ground. Another thing to keep in mind is that most blackberries are thorny, which has uh, dissuaded many people from growing them. However, we do have many new releases of thornless blackberries that homeowners can try as well. So jumping into some of the research studies that have been, have been going on here at NDSU, I will first talk about the primocane blackberries. Uh, pictured here is one of my colleagues, Abby Debner. She has been the one leading the research in primocane blackberries. And this is actually a picture of her in her high tunnel. You can see the plants are growing very vigorously and look very healthy. And she did have a measure of success. As you can see in her picture there, she has some nice ripe fruit in her hand in the picture uh, on the bottom right, as well as some others in the uh, picture in the background. And this is a T type of trellis system that's used to just hold the canes up in a nice, neat row. For overwintering purposes in her study, she cut the primocanes back to the ground after she harvested them in the late summer and early fall. And this is just to overwinter the primocanes as they are even less hardy than the floricanes typically. So in her study, she had a high tunnel versus a bare soil control outside of the high tunnel and a silver reflective mulch. So she had three different environments that she was testing uh, for this study. And what she found was that the high tunnel had an earlier fruit set, a higher yield, and improved growth compared to the other two environments. However, even with this uh, high tunnel improving the growth of the primocanes compared to the other two environments, uh, they still do not compare to floricane production. With the uh, lower yield and the thorny erect type of primocanes that are available, as well as the late fruit set, in her study she found that a lot of fruit was left on the canes even late into uh, September when the first uh, frost came. So the small portion of the primocane that fruits in the first year uh, does not generally yield enough to uh, be economical for a producer, but as a homeowner, this would have some potential if you just enjoy having a, a few nice fruit in the fall. So some growing tips for primocane blackberries for those of you who are interested. Uh, we have Prime Jim, Prime Jan, uh, Primark 45, Primark Freedom, and Primark Traveler. Now the first three are thorny. Um, they can be kind of hard to handle. The Prime Jim and the Prime Jam were probably the top yielders in her study, with Prime Jim being the best. If you look at the picture on the right, uh, it just shows a, a tipped blackberry primocane. And it is recommended that you tip them when they're about half a meter tall, just to increase the branching in the blackberries to increase the yield. And also, it is suggested here in North Dakota to cut back the canes in the fall so you can cover and protect that crown and make sure that that survives the winter as well as produce them in a hedgerow with a tea trellis just to support the canes and keep them in a nice row. In her study, uh, Abby cut the canes back all the way to the ground and just did the uh, fall, early so or late summer harvest. However, I would even extend that into cutting the primate canes back to maybe uh, eight inches or a foot off the ground, which would still allow you to cover the blackberry crowns easily but it might also give you some production early in the summer from those buds left on the floor canes. Now, moving into my study, I'm studying floor cane blackberries in North Dakota. And this picture here is a good example of a hedgerow type of system. Uh, this picture was taken in North Carolina when I visited there this summer. So taking a, a hedgerow system like that, very simple, easy to use, uh, this is the type of system that I used in my study. It's called a rotating cross-arm trellis system. And what this does is it allows us to easily cover the blackberries in the fall and protect them from winter temperatures. And I actually brought a piece of my trellis system to show you today, and so I'll show you a little bit about how that works. So if you look at this uh, piece of my trellis system, you can see that it has two rotatable arms. And we also have, if you look at the pictures, 
uh, the wires that will be running through uh, these holes in the arms, as well as wires that run through the bottom piece here, horizontally along the ground next to the blackberries. The primocanes are trained, probably three or four per plant, along these bottom wires. And once they reach the next plant, the tips of the primocanes are pinched off and the laterals will shoot and are trained along the wires that run up this arm here. Now what this allows us to do is to rotate the arm, the arm and the blackberry canes to the ground um, and easily being able to cover them. And what this does is the primocanes that are trained along that wire will simply twist instead of bending the entire cane, which requires a lot less force and a, you are a lot less likely to break those canes as a result. Another thing that we're able to do with this system is we're able to, after we uncover the primocanes, on, or the, after we uncover the blackberries in the spring, we leave that arm close to the ground and allow it to flower. And after it flowers, we then rotate it back to that 60 degree angle so that all the fruit will be on one side of that system. Easy to pick and it will reduce other things such as sun scald and white druplet disorder. And with this system, we can change a very unruly looking plant that's growing in every direction, probably have fruit hiding in the canopy there. And like I was saying, we can have this nice even plane of growth that we can have all the fruit on one side of the plant. However, if you remember the growth habits I was talking about, the erect type don't like being moved around very much. And this type, Illini hardy, uh, did not do as well in some of the plants. That thick uh, erect cane either could crack or break. Uh, it's just a few cases in which that happened, but something to keep in mind. Here's a picture of the winter row covers that I applied in my study. We have a uh, six millimeter thick black plastic, and we also have a polyethylene thermal blanket uh, in, the, in the background there. And so with, this, uh, with these row covers, we had those fabrics, and then we also had a corn stover or a wheat, uh, wheat straw mulch on top of that to insulate them. We also have snow cover that would further insulate the blackberries. However, the last two years, we haven't had a whole lot of that. Uh, this picture is from the winter of 2014 and 2015, uh, when we had very little snow cover. And if you look in the pictures, you can see that I have data loggers in there as well that have thermal couplers underneath all the treatments. And this is just to uh, keep track of the temperatures underneath the treatments during the winter. One thing you're gonna wanna uh, remember with this type of a system is uh, get down your weed control uh, before the spring. And you might have a mess with the mulch in the spring as well. So make sure you have enough room to work to get rid of that easily. We had varying amounts of winter damage. Uh, if you look at the picture closely, you can see that when we uncovered it, some of these canes actually still had green leaves on them. We also had blackberry plants where the floor canes died back completely, but you can see that there's new primocanes emerging. Or blackberries that died completely, leaving us with an, a gap in our research. Now, going back to those uh, data loggers that I had underneath all the treatments, I just want to point out a few things here. Uh, so we have treatment one is our black plastic with corn stover, treatment two, black plastic with wheat straw, then our thermal blanket with corn stover, and we also had a thermal blanket with no mulch, and then the blue is the air temperature. Now, if you look closely at this uh, graph here, we have the treatments following a very similar path. They're not really that different. Uh, through a be the beginning of the winter. But if you remember last year, we had a very unseasonably warm March and April, and the thermal blanket more closely follows the air temperature after that because the insulation from the snow left. Very similarly with the weekly low temperature underneath the treatments, the thermal blanket did not moderate the temperature as well earlier in the winter when there wasn't any snow cover yet. Now, remembering that the first three treatments with mulches were very similar in their temperature moderation, 
uh, it's surprising to see that the treatment three had much better uh, winter survival as well as yield and number of fruit uh, compared to the rest of the treatments. Uh, if you just look at the graph there, we have the number of live buds, the length of live cane, the overall yield, and just the number of fruit. Uh, just another graph just to show you a little bit about the different cultivars that were in the study. We had 10 cultivars in this study. Illini Hardy is the blue line that went up to 1,000 grams in treatment 3. But if you look and compare that to treatment 1 and treatment 2, that similar plant, uh, the same cultivar, yielded almost nothing. So the type of row cover that you put on your blackberries is very important. One of the things that could, be could have caused this difference was the difference in the permeability of these row cover treatments. The black plastic does not allow any sunlight, air, air movement, or moisture to go through this row cover. Versus the thermal blanket, which was very porous, allows sunlight in and some air exchange. The black plastic caused this ideolation, um, this uh, prevention of sunlight to go through, causing this weak growth. Uh, this weak growth was further damaged by a late frost. Uh, these are some of the tips you can see are damaged by the frost there, some of the leaves. And in the black plastic treatment, that weakened growth on the left there was even more damaged. So I want to talk about some cultivar differences very quickly. Uh, we have Illini Hardy on the left, Arapaho in the middle, and Natchez on the right. Uh, you can just see that the fruits vary in size. Illini Hardy, about three grams per fruit. Arapaho, closer to five or six. And Natchez, you're getting up to closer to eight to ten. Uh, we also had a, a variety of um, cultivars there going along that spectrum. Here, I just wanted to point out Kiowa, very large fruit. I had one that was 23.9 grams. And I, I do have fairly large hands. That I don't just have small hands. It's a very large fruit. And we have Wichita on the left, also very nice, firm fruit. And I believe we have more Kiowa on the right. So there are very big cultivar differences in the size of the fruit uh, as well as in the yield. So just some recommendations that I would make based upon our first year of findings. Uh, this is very new research. We do need a few more years in order to really recommend things uh, 100%. So right now, this is just some things that I would recommend for homeowners to trial if you're willing to. For Apache and Arapaho, I would not recommend planting those. Uh, they're very erect, hard to get to uh, work with this type of a system, also very low yield. Chester, while they did have smaller fruit, uh, very good yield, so I would recommend trialing that one. Doyle's, very poor yield, uh, would not trial that one. Illini Hardy, best yield out of the whole study. However, it's thorny and very erect, hard to work with, but if you really want a good yield, you can try that one. Kiowa, very large fruit. Um, I did like that one. However, it does have thorns and a little less winter hardy, so you could maybe try that one. Uh, Natchez, uh, Wichita, and Triple Crown, also very good. Uh, thornless varieties, large fruit, easy to work with. And Osage, very poor survival. I would not recommend that one. So one thing I want to mention for all of you who would like to try blackberries or any other fruit out there, uh, keep an eye out for spotted wing drosophila. It can be very devastating to your crop. Uh, we did have some of that out in our research plots. Uh, if you look in the upper left picture there, you can see the fly itself. It has the two spots on its wings there. That is the male fly. The female doesn't have those spots. So if you see a suspicious fly, try to identify it anyway. Uh, you can use a fermentation trap like the one on the right there. It's just a uh, uh, vinegar... Uh, mix. Uh, you can use a uh, wine, anything like that. Uh, you can see the damage there on the bottom left to some uh, black raspberries. It can be very damaging. And if you don't have a trap out there to uh, monitor for them, they can be, uh, their population can explode very quickly if you do not uh, keep an eye out for them. Uh, conclusion, uh, bottom line, it is possible to grow blackberries in North Dakota. It can require a little work. However, it has many benefits. Like I said, they're very flavorful, really good for you with antioxidants and vitamins, as well as that potential for a niche market if you're looking to diversify your farm or your business. Uh, with that, I'd like to open the floor to any questions.
Okay, thank you, David. All right, let's see here. How about uh, David? Can you pot? Can you have potted blackberries and overwintered them in a garage or shed? Uh, yes, I, I would say that's possible. Uh, you would need a fairly large pot. Um, you also have to be careful with your uh, garage being too warm or having too much light coming through in the windows. Uh, that can cause premature growth in the spring. Uh, as well as your plants could dry out. Even though they're not active, the roots can still desiccate in a, in a controlled area like that. Uh, it's possible. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, uh, but I think you could try it. People love their blackberries, evidently, <laughs> here I tell you. Um, where's a good place to get plants? Uh, so a lot of these are pretty new cultivars. Uh, I actually received a catalog the other day from Gurney's. Uh, they had several of the cultivars in there. Uh, I believe they had Wichita, Triple Crown, um, Apache, Arapaho, and they also had Primark Freedom. So they're becoming more available, uh, but I don't know of any local nurseries that would carry them because they are all labeled for zone 5 or higher. Uh, so you're not going to find them locally. That's a good comment. And also I have to put our disclaimer here that we're not here to endorse any one company <laughs> over the other, um, nor do we mean to purposely uh, not say any companies. Um, <clears throat> is there a good spray for the Drosophila fruit fly, the spotted wing Drosophila? Uh, there are some effective ones out there. Um, however, they do have a quick generation time, so they could develop resistance very quickly. Uh, I do have a few notes uh, on that. Um, so you could use a Asana uh, or Malathion or a Mustang Max. Uh, so those would work. You have to make sure you rotate them so they don't develop that resistance, however. Yeah, we've got a really nice publication from NDSU Extension uh, led by Esther McGinnis. She wrote a, a Jan Canola. She did a nice publication about spotted wing Drosophila and on especially raspberries are a big concern. Um, but I would I would point towards you to that, to Google that, our spotted wing drosophila. Integrated pest management, a spotted wing drosophila. They've got um, good recommendations of the products that you mentioned and even some more. How about David, uh, does blackberries make good wine? Of course, are you, are you, uh, you look so young, I don't know if you're <laughs> old enough to drink yet. Um, does it make good fruit juice? <laughs> So, uh, yes, I'd, probably the yeah, you don't get enough to make wine. <laughs> um, no, I'm sure you could try it. Uh, there are recipes out there for that. Um, you could make a uh, blackberry brandy if you want. That wouldn't uh, require as much fruit, um, but I'm sure you can try it. There's blackberry wine out there. So, Yeah. Um, okay, let's move on from that, those questions. How about, uh, can you repeat how to make that Drosophila trap again? Uh, so you can have a, a wine vinegar mix. Uh, I think it's usually like 60% wine, 40% vinegar. Uh, you could just use a apple vinegar mix. I'm sure if you uh, just Google a, ver a fermentation trap, it's a very general trap that's used for a lot of insects. So you're going to have a hard time maybe sorting through a trap like that. I would suggest putting one of those yellow sticky trap cards in there so that you, they would get caught in that for easier identification. Okay, let me just try to figure out this computer here, excuse me. Okay. You know, one thing you didn't mention, David, maybe because there wasn't that many to eat, but you didn't uh, talk about the flavor of any of these special, of these cultivars. Do you have oh, okay. Just the size you talked about. Are there any substantial differences among the cultivars as flavor? If so, which ones would you recommend? Yeah, so there's definitely a difference in flavor. Uh, I would say that Triple Crown was probably the most flavorful to me. Um, some of the smaller fruits, such as Chester or Illini Hardy, did not have as much flavor. Um, however, when you get those larger fruits, such as uh, Kiowa, they might be a little more watered down. Uh, but Triple Crown was uh, probably by far my most flavorful blackberry. Uh, we did not do any uh, taste test paneling though, so this is all subjective to my taste. Okay. Um, all right. Let's keep the questions coming. Um, how about we just kind of, I really like your summary there at the end. It's very helpful. Puts it all together for us. We hear a lot about those primocanes, the ones that, that bear in their first year okay. canes. 
But now you're saying that it, it really doesn't seem like that's the way to go because the fruit is so late that for much of North Dakota, we're just not going to get any decent crops on a prime cane, at least not a reliable crop on a prime cane system. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yes, uh, that is kind of what I'm uh, concluding with the prime canes. Uh, however, prime Jim and prime Jan do fairly well. Uh, you could see uh, upward to a pound per plant. Um, I would not expect to get much more than that. Uh, however, uh, if you would maybe try the system which I recommended pruning the primocanes to a foot and then covering them, you could maybe get that additional yield in the early summer. Uh, for this study, we pruned them all the way back to the ground and avoided that, but you could perhaps try to get that earlier summer production as well to increase your yield. So if I use that primocane system and let's say I use prime gym, um, and I cut the canes down to about a foot tall. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. In the early, you know, late wind, late, uh, late fall, early winter. Mm -hmm. And then when I cover them, do I, do I bury them or do I just cover with three inches of straw or do you so cover the whole thing? What I would do is I would use some sort of a fabric or uh, a plastic to cover them and then put the mulch on top of that. I would put several inches of mulch. Uh, like that black landscape fabric? Is that what you were showing? Uh, or, uh, black landscape fabric would work. Um, I prefer the, uh, the thermal blanket um, that I was using because it has a little more porosity to it and doesn't smother the plants. Um, how, if you use that uh, thermal blanket type of material as well as some mulch, I think you could overwinter them successfully. Right. And um, also, when you were covering, when you were using your fluorocaine system, you think the fluorocaine system in the long run that might be the most productive system for us? Yes, I think that the fluorocaine production system has more potential for a higher yield. Uh, Illini Hardy, there, as you saw, had uh, over two and a half pounds, or about two pounds of production. Uh, on average for that plant. And you, I have to remind you, this was a, a non-irrigated system um, with minimal inputs because we weren't near a uh, water source. However, with uh, proper irrigation and the right nutrients uh, applied, I think you could up that production. And some of the younger uh, plants of the other cultivars, once they're established, they could probably do uh, better as well. These are plants that aren't uh, really old. They're pretty new plants. So after establishment, we could have a higher yield. So if I'm really into this, I'm going to maybe try that Illinois, Illinois Hardy, and I'll use that trellis system that you showed us tonight. Um, well, or for not. this trellis system, it depends. If you're oh, gung-ho, oh, if you're gung-ho and you can deal with the thorns, a... Illinois Hardy has thorns. And if you're going to train it, it involves a lot of touching the, the blackberry. So if you can deal with the thorns, Illinois Hardy, but if not, Chester was the second highest producer, and that one's yes. a thornless. And so I would okay, recommend that Chester. one. And, but the flavor wasn't that great of Chester. Chester is a smaller fruit and not quite as good of a flavor. Um, Triple Crown, Natchez, those did very well, easily trained. And the system that worked the best was it was TBC, was that the TBC? Uh, oh, the thermal blanket with corn stover. Thermal blanket with yep. corn stover. Yep, so the that thermal the blanket and with the two inches of corn stover, or just a little mulch. Uh, if you had enough snow cover, it would probably be fine, but you can't always trust Mother Nature to work with you. Okay, um, so when um, when are we going to get a nice publication from you? Before, when are you graduating, David? Uh, so I'll be graduating December. December uh, so, what year? Uh, this this year, this year December. So you got the whole several months now to write an extension publication on a primer of growing blackberries in North Dakota. Should we be looking forward to that? Uh, yes, definitely look forward to yeah, that. Um, you know, this is being taped, you know. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to share this with your advisor. Okay, well, I look forward to that. Does anybody have any other questions before on this? Well, how about we had a question about uh, when you say tipping, is that when you cut the tips off the primocane? to promote branch growth? Yes, so okay. with tipping, we call it soft tipping, where you'll just take off that couple top inches of the of the cane to promote that lateral growth and to increase yield that way. Okay, thank you. Okay, there you go. Thank you, David. And